Hello and welcome to another episode of Lore Bites. I'm Brutus, and in this episode I'm going to be analyzing Hemwick Village and the Witch's Abode. Hemwick Village is located on the outskirts of Cathedral Ward, and it serves as a drop-off and pick-up point for travelers going to the sealed-off forsaken castle Canehurst. The inhabitants of Hemwick have all gone mad, and we find them in various states of glee or dance or, or sorrow. These villages are seemingly under the command of a duo of witches known as the Witches of Hemwick. In terms of Lovecraft canon, this area is most heavily influenced by a story, The Picture in the House, and to a lesser extent, The Color Out of Space, I think. The guys over at Bonfireside Chat have talked about these influences in really great detail, so I'll leave a link to relevant episodes, the podcast is really spectacular. Apparently some time ago, Hemwick was a farming village of some kind. Villages will attack you with plows, hammers, and sickles, makeshift agriculture weapons, and there's this conspicuous statue of some kind of sinister farming figure. A lot of the set pieces are farmhouse related, like this barn, and there's a lot of these kinds of buildings that I interpret to be grain silos, which are currently being used instead to store hundreds of corpses. I think this is strong evidence that Hemwick was once a major source of food production and storage for both Yarnum and Canehurst and subsequently it could have been a strategically important location during the war between the Church and the Vilebloods. I also think that when the Plague of Beasts started ravaging Yarnum, the bodies of the deceased were dumped here, first buried in graves but eventually without any ceremony once all available land had been filled up. This is how Hemwick gained its title of Hemwick Charnel Lane. From memory, pre-release material also referred to the area as Hemwick Graveyard. At some point, things started to really go south for Hemwick, and the village as we find it now is not only completely mad, but has also been repurposed into an enormous torture dungeon or organ harvesting operation. YouTuber Jerk Sands Frontiers also pointed out that the village has taken on an industrial function as well. There's a lot of smoke and will look like little cremation houses, and you can make the logical leap that corpses are being constantly cremated here in order to manufacture bone marrow ash, which we know comes from this area. Maybe this is what other bodies are being stored for. I'll put a link to his video on Hemwick in the description below. His content is fantastic and definitely something to check out if you're looking for more of a lore meal rather than a lore bite. I'll be bringing up his video quite a few times, so it's worth watching it even if it's a bit long. The Hemwick witches themselves are known for harvesting eyeballs for their arcane rituals. They wear a coat made of eyeballs they've harvested and have an especially nasty grab attack where they pry out your eyes with a melon bowler. Given that the player doesn't actually lose their vision or their eyeballs, this is probably just for dramatic effect. The boss fight takes place in this enormous building at the very end of Hemwick Charno Lane. You can actually see this building from the very beginning, and part of why I find this so impressive is that you can actually see the crows circling the building even from the other end of the level. Speaking of crows, Hemwick is filled with them. Not just the bloated man-sized carrying crows we encountered back in Yarnum either, but regular sized crows as well. There's a few hanging out around the lamp that fly away when you first enter the area. If you look up from a few points in the level, you can actually see more of these crows flying around overhead. So why does this area have such an abundance of crows? Well, if you watch the Jerk Sands Frontiers video, he talks about how it might have something to do with the sky burial mentioned in the crow feather set description, which would make Hemwick something like charnel grounds found in Tibetan funereal practices. I think that this is a compelling argument, and it's grown on me over time, but I still don't know if I agree with it entirely. I think it's just as possible that these bodies were left up as a form of punishment, and that's the explanation that I gravitate towards for some reason, maybe just because I find it opens up more storytelling possibilities. Personally, I think that the crows are both a stylistic choice and have a pretty basic explanation. This area is filled with corpses left out in the open air, which I'll talk about again later on, and this would obviously attract a lot of carrying feeding crows. Crows also love going after eyes, so this fits with the theme of the level. I believe that the bloated crows are what happens when crows gorge themselves on flesh infected with the plague of beasts, which manifests in them by ballooning them to enormous sizes. Hemwick is apparently mostly free of the beast plague, you'll notice that the village women don't exhibit most of the symptoms of the plague except maybe for elongated limbs. For me, this is evidence that Hemwick is societally cut off from Yarnum, where drinking blood is commonplace and everybody is infected as a result. Although, it probably also helps that Hemwick cremates so many diseased bodies. It makes sense that there would be a lot of crows that haven't dined on beast flesh and just remained their regular cute little selves here. Returning to the witch's abode, the building is actually much larger than the area the fight takes place in, although there's no way for us to access it. What functional purpose did such an enormous building serve? 
Personally, I think it's related to Hemwick's connection with Kanehurst. If you actually look, the broken path that the Kanehurst stagecoach departs from doesn't actually line up at all with the shattered bridge in the distance. In fact, if we were to follow it, it would extend directly into a rocky outcrop. It's probably just artistic license or a geographical inconsistency, but I think it's also not a huge leap to imagine that the bridge from Kinghurst could have once connected to this building instead. Maybe, once upon a time, it served as a stop-off for deliveries or travelers en route to the noble castle. Alternatively, the building could have also been a kind of way station or hotel for travelers to rest at, or maybe even a manor for a local ruler or a summer home for the nobles themselves. It's certainly big enough, and it has more ornate architecture compared to the rest of the village. The most compelling evidence for this building being quite special is that, once you pass through the portcullis, you notice that this whole area is actually walled off from the rest of town, like a manor courtyard or gardens, with this building here being the groundskeeper's residence. If we were to try and plot out the geography of the area before everything fell apart, it would go something like this. First, this is open graveyard area, what I describe as Hemwick outskirts, and although the area title card doesn't show up until later, I believe it is regionally still a part of Hemwick due to this signage. This area is being guarded by riflemen. Next, we move into the village proper where all the women reside and which has been converted into a grisly chamber of horrors. And lastly, we pass through the gate and wind up in the manor courtyard where journeys for Kanehurst depart and move up into the manor itself. The witch's boss room is extremely spacious and features a high roof. You can see from a distance that it's structurally distinct, basically a different annex to the building rather than just a large room. There was once a wooden bridge that ran across the length of this space, although what exact function this served I'm not really sure. I believe that this room once functioned as either a ballroom or something of a town hall, which would explain why the witches have taken up residence here, and that this bridge would have once been a platform for speakers to stand on and address the crowd. After the fight, there's a little basement room where we find a tied up hunter carrying the rune workshop tool. I actually don't want to talk about this at all because it opens up a whole different kind of proverbial worms that I don't want to deal with in this video. There's also the detail of all the strung up bodies in the area leading up to the building. At first I thought these bodies were impaled, but they look like they're actually just tied to the posts. Not that it's any less macabre, but as I said previously, it's been speculated that these bodies have been left out for the crows as sky burial. However, this kind of imagery of fields of bodies mounted on pikes also has a strong historical basis associated with capital punishment and regimes of terror. Vlad Tepes III of Wallachia, commonly known as Vlad the Impaler or Dracula, was especially fond of execution by impalement and leaving the bodies out on display. After a failed assassination attempt on his life in 1462, the road to his capital city of Targo Vista supposedly grew to be surrounded by a forest of 20,000 impaled corpses. This kind of punishment, whether it was used to execute via exposure or performed after death, was more symbolic than practical. Victims could be left out next to roads as an example, and subsequently, it was used often as a punishment for crimes against the state, often in rural and provincial regions. For example, highwaymen, wartime rebels, deserters, and grave robbers were often punished in this way because they had violated the sanctity of state and religious power. If this is the same in Bloodborne's world, then any of these possibilities could be true for Hemwick. The question that piques my interest is, in this instance, who is the state? Jerk Sands Frontiers gives his interpretation that Hemwick is still serving the church's needs to some capacity, and there is some compelling evidence for that he provides. Particularly, the village might have been used to produce bone marrow ash for the church, which is supported by the item being unlocked after obtaining the Radiant Sword Hunter badge. However, there's a lot of things that contradict this. Firstly, Hemwick is apparently closed off from Cathedral Ward and heavily guarded, and there's no church presence here in terms of enemies. Given Hemrick Channel Lane's direct relationship with Kanehurst, I think this is an equally likely alternative theory. The area is heavily fortified against intruders from the Yarnamend, with multiple shut gates, disabled elevators, and a lowered portcullis. Hemrick outskirts is securely guarded by snipers who cover each other. These were apparently the men of the village who took to arming themselves and stand watch over the village entrance. Could they be guarding for an invasion, maybe from an army of burly men with golden hats and big wheels? You're a beast hunter, aren't you? I knew it. That's precisely how I started out. The way I see it, if these bodies are the results of capital punishment, it could have been perpetrated by two main parties. Firstly, it might have been the executioners living up to their title. They could have scoured the village on their way through to Kanehurst, leaving dozens of villages strung up as an example of what happened to those who served the nobles and betrayed the church. 
This could have been the event that galvanized the village into isolation and fortification against the outside world. Alternatively, these bodies could have been left by the villagers themselves spurred to a witch hunt, ironically, by actual witches, of anybody who refused to join the murderous cult, or were outsiders passing through like ourselves. Whether or not this was done in service of Cainhurst or not isn't really clear. They might have been tasked with harvesting bloodshot eyeballs for forbidden blood rituals by the Cainhursts, or simply doing it out of obsession for their own purposes. The Canehurst hunters are also the ones most partial to firearms, so I can imagine that the village could have been converted into an ash factory at their behest. As you can see, there's a lot of unanswered questions and ambiguities related to this area, and I can't really resolve them. I hope to end this video with a recap plotting out my timeline of events, but as I was preparing it, I realized that there were too many compelling and contradicting interpretations for me to pick just one. In the end, I hope that this video serves as a good jumping off point for you to draw your own conclusions. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit like and subscribe to my channel. Feel free to check out the rest of my lore bite series as well if you haven't seen any of them before. Join me next episode where I'll be having a quick look at the Hunter Chief emblem and some weird little quirks around Cathedral Ward before moving on and preparing for the Old Hunters DLC.